So, what is an exchange? Let's break a few myths, which seems like a good idea. Sometimes I've been abroad and I'm, I, I want to change money, euros, dollars, but money isn't changed fundamentally. There is no machine that you put euros in and dollars come out. So we asked ourselves, what is this process, this model of an exchange? Maybe you know, but this is a good moment to face this question. We can see money as containers of liquids. This is the euro, this is the dollar. The change, the exchange, is not simply taking euros, putting them in the, the dollar barrel, because we've been mixing two liquids, which to separate them will be a pretty complicated operation. In reality, this does not happen. Something completely different happens. In this world of dollars, there's someone who's got some dollars and is ready to sacrifice them in exchange of euros. In this other world, there's someone who's got some euros and is ready to sacrifice them because he wants dollars. These two worlds are not in contact with each other. They don't see each other. They are, they are needs that live in different worlds, like who needs a wife, who needs a husband. In Finland, there's a woman who's looking for a husband. In Ghana, there's somebody who's looking for a wife. If there was a world in which these two subjects could meet each other, maybe there would be an exchange. But if we analyze them from separate defined worlds. This is the euro, this is the dollar. What does the exchange do? It creates a point of encounter, a point of meeting point. In theory, if somebody has dollars and needs euros, maybe wants to come to Europe, he assigns them to the exchange. It says, I'd love to come to Europe if someone gives me the euros, I'll, I'll ha happily come. On the other side, there's somebody who's got euros who wants to go to the United States. And does makes the same question. And they enter into an exchange market in which if you find the right coincidence between I want to change something into something else, there's a direct exchange. And the business of all this of an exchange is to keep some of this money. I keep a bit of this, a commission, and the game goes on like this. This is what we have seen in a superficial way as how exchanges of money take place. In Bitcoin, it's the same thing, same principle. It's not real money. They're written in a book, a register, Ethereum is the same thing. Dollars have a different system. There's a central bank. There's a central register. There's no register of the single owners of the money. You have cash, but there's no way of knowing how much cash you've got. We can guess it, but there's no register of how much you have. But there is a register of how many dollars and euros you have in the bank. These registers are visible and can be exchanged, and these intermediation operations are managed digitally. The same thing happens okay, in the currency market for Bitcoin. There are many people who have got Bitcoin, and they want euros, 
So these are sellers. And there are lots of people who've got euros and would like to buy some Bitcoin. An exchange puts itself in the middle and tries to do matching. Clearly, at a higher level, the, these exchanges do something different. They buy dollars and Bitcoins so they can make instantaneous matches. It's not if you find somebody who wants this and do this. They tend to buy everything, so they have the volumes of cash that allows them to do this. And so they can serve the market in the best possible way. But the principle of speculation exists. If an exchange has got inside a thousand bitcoins, Who fixes the price of the Bitcoin? There are algorithms which determine the price on the basis of the best possible earnings by the exchange. This is the, called the Newton method. It's a, with which can be used to uh, launch a cannonball without a target and find a method to find the place. Let's do this in two dimensions. It's got to hit precisely here. The person who regulates this cannon hasn't got a lot of tools to know how to hit it. Hasn't got crossfires, he sends some cannonball by chance and uh, it ends up here. Not, not bad. <laughs> At that point, I have to fire a second shot. The first thing I see, if I've gone above or below the target, in this case, I went over it, so if previously I had fired at 40 degrees, I'll divide that by 2, 20 degrees. So I fire at 20 degrees and it ends up here. I still haven't taken the target. At this point, I start shooting at the halfway between the first and second shots. Thirty degrees. I still haven't the target, so I divide the thirty and the twenty, and I fire twenty-five. And the end, I hit the target. This is the Newton method. It's an iterative method, which you fire, you see the results, and with a few more shots, iteratively, iteratively. If this was a series, infinitely I can get to the, the, the target. This is never used infinitely. You estimate how much estim, uh, error can be tolerated and you stop when the error is compatible with the, the acceptable error. When the, it's a large target, it doesn't matter if it's 20 degrees or 22 degrees, as long as you hit it, that's okay. If you want greater precision, you continue <laughs> to infinity unless you get a limit where you know how to stop. This technique is used in the exchanges to determine the price of any token. And it works exactly like the Canon. Andrea makes an Andrea coin. How much is an Andrea coin worth? Nothing. Nobody's interested in something that's worth zero, so he gives it a value of 10. At this point, on the 
value of 10, it's listed in the exchange. The exchange wants to earn 20% on the exchange. Let's make it 50% so we don't have to get worried about small change, 10%. The exchange says, when I've sorted at 10, 100 people were interested. They bought the token at this price, 10 euros. So the token has been sold for a thousand. And the exchange has earned 100, 10%. Is that a lot or a little? Who can say? I've hit the target. Who knows if anybody would buy it at 20? At 10 people bought it, let's see what happens. Let's take it at 20. I fire a longer range and this time fewer people buy it, but that doesn't mean it's a mistake. At 20, only 40 people buy it. Okay. How much has Andrea earned complexively? 800. The profitability for the exchange is lower uh, relative to what it could have been. So I've fired too high. Let's take a step back. Let's try five. At five, I, send, I sell 10,000 at five with a thousand tokens at five. But you've depreciated a lot. But I've sold at 10,000, I've made 5,000. If I've made 5,000, the, the earning is 500. At this point, the exchange is only much more lowering the price than raising it. Clearly. Who's losing out on this? So if the game works like this, we could say, let's lower the price even further. Let's put it at one. At one, if before there were 500 buyers, maybe at one, 600 people will buy it. 600 people, they've bought more than before, but at a lower price. So complexively, if you look at the performance of any initial quotation, it starts more or less from a random value. For practical reasons, let's say it's random. There's some initiatives and after. These initiatives are all attempts to improve the result. What in reality doesn't get said is that the people think that the more they buy, the more the price will change. In reality, it's different. The more the price changes, uh, the more people buy. So it's the other way around. It's important to know that it's not the sale and purchase that fixes the performance, but the sale and the purchase set, set a stimulus for the model of calculation to try and send another shot. So if less is earned, the system tries to lower the price to sell more. If it sells more, the system tries to hire the price to see if it can earn from the fact that it's selling more. So the performance of this system depends more on the algorithm than on the market. It's the algorithm that makes the market, not the other way around. Let's say this is the performance of Bitcoin until Elon Musk decided to accept payment in Bitcoin for the Tesla. At that point, until that point, if you get the maths, Around this point, 
there was no news from Elon Musk. The moment he gives this news, the system doesn't know that news has been given. So the system goes on a bit further. So the system updates every second. If he's here at this point, this he doesn't know if it's a minimum or a maximum because it depends on what happens next. At this point, he, he tries to lower the price because we don't know that Elon Musk has given this piece of news. People seeing the news begin to buy Bitcoin. This seems to understand that this lowering of the price is increasing the transactions, but it re reacts to this increase in transactions. So if five it works, let's see what happens at six and continues to arrive. And if six arrives, he tries seven. It's there are two events which are disconnected for the algorithm, but which port to take to the same result. There's no algorithm that understands what's in the news. There's an algorithm that attempts, according to its experience, the, there's machine learning by now. They are, they are not well-known equations, but it keeps trying to increase the efficiency of its sales because, I repeat the maths, if this is the performance of the price, of Bitcoin, the earnings for the exchange is the integral of these, this curve divided by the percentage multiplied. So what happens is that if effectively he realizes that increasing the price, increasing the price has reduced the productivity proportionally proportionally to the price increase. And it goes down, goes down sufficiently to get to a certain point where the people who see it is going down, they still don't sell. They're not going to sell, they don't buy. Until we get this point, people get interested. Ah, going down, I've increased more power of purchase. So now he has the difficulty to go up because he always has difficulty going up. If it was just structured to go up, we go up and up to the infinite, but it's structured to go down to the price that when it goes down, the price improves, not for the world of crypto. Let's take a football game. Let's take the game Juventus Milan. The betting price can change from one betting shop to one another. Depends on the competition. Each one makes its calculations. Each has different situations. So each is free to do for 10 or for 11. Then they realized that someone was playing financial tricks, betting on the game with one company and making compensating bets with another on the basis that the prices were different between the betting companies. So there were winners who were always winning like this. As this damages the policies, there's a kind of agreement internally as to how the prices should be set. In the case of Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's clear that the price is determined according to the standards that are entrusted to other subjects who are more centralized than it, is, than it seems. So behind all this, is a marriage of mathematics, mathematics, finance, politics. But to reply to the question oh, talking about other currencies, the Andrea coin works in the same way, but it's quoted by an external source. If I go on Binance, I consider Binance if you do an experiment, nice experiment, but it's not free, let's say you've got nothing to do. 
quote the token on Binance and Coinbase if they accept you. At a certain point, they'll have different prices. So you can take them, sell them on Binance, and buy them back again on Coinbase. There's an important barrier to entry. Today, it's not that easy to quote on an exchange. There are specific contracts. They're relatively exclusive to avoid all this. What is interesting is to analyze is why people quote on exchanges. There are two principal motives. The first is called spray and pray. If you had a portfolio of monies, A, B, C, D, it can be shown easily the world of crypto is growing. It's, it's hard to show that Andrea coin is growing because the Andrea coin has its own performance. If you look to the past, you can see what Bitcoin lost 10 years ago today. You can see, has it grown? Ethereum, the same. Now, bet that they will grow tomorrow is difficult, but in 10 years, that there could be important growth for a long-term investor is, is easier for certain aspects. So what happens if you're a crypto investor and you can see what was happening, and say, be a potential expert. When you see the end of the coin, hmm, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'll take a bit. I don't know. It doesn't cost much. I can I can check it away if necessary. I'll put 10, 20 euros. It doesn't, it's not important. So somebody begins to give 10 euros to Andrea. Ah, Andrea thinks my project's working. They're financing me. This is interesting. Somebody else does a spray and pay. Oh well, I may as well take this and that. And somebody concentrates only on Andrea. I'm going to invest in him. I don't care about the rest. If it, if it goes, I'll buy. But Andrea's curve, 10, 20, 30, people are buying it. So the project works and I buy a 40. Because I'm observing an emerging property of a complex system. It's hard to know what makes it grow and shrink, but there are people who look at different faces of the coin. This is what taking Bitcoin from loose change to the first round of 10,000 euros. What's the real reason that Bitcoin went so quickly? The story goes that somebody paid 50 bitcoins for a pizza and bitcoin was still worth cents. It wasn't of interest to anybody. It arrived at $200 with great difficulty. You can see this in all the graphs. One day, 2015, Luca got a phone call me from this place I can't say where I was dealing with this information security we've got a disaster our Dropbox has been hacked and all the files in it have been encrypted but there's a file called read dot readme dot doc that can be opened in this file, it says that all your data has been encrypted. It can't be recovered. You can try if you want to, unless you send me half a Bitcoin at the time, 500 euros. And I will give you back the key. At this point, they call me and we look into this. I look into Google. Somebody tells me, has paid this half a Bitcoin has received the key and after a few heresies 
has managed to get his data back. So the, the news spreads, it works. It's not a fraud, okay? it's worth paying. 500 euros, otherwise I'll have to close the company. So yes, it does work. I've seen news and read it. I pay 500, but the big cost was the person who took 5,000 euros to help me understand this. The expert who said it doesn't work, maybe it doesn't work. The problem became one thing. Where do I find half the Bitcoin? So everybody threw themselves into the, the worst markets everywhere. So if you look at what was happening before and then afterwards, it went 250, 300. See how many people were buying it. 500, 600, 800, 1,000. 1,200, 2,000. As the price went up, more and more people were interested. Not because the price went up, because the people were independently interested of the price. Because the first one said, what's half a Bitcoin? The other said, half a Bitcoin could save my business. So if whatever the price is, it could save my business. So a phenomenon that was completely external, a crypto locker, and it wasn't the first time he had tried, but finally managed it. Then this person got arrested. Ransomware is still one of the most profitable attacks in the world. At this point, everybody started looking for Bitcoin. And this is what gave the first push to 12,000. First 200, then 12,000. Then, having arrived at 12,000, it began being of interest to those who invested. This is interesting, it's gone from 200 to 12,000. Until the other day, people did trading through mud of Bitcoin. Then they said, this is interesting. So they went from 12 to 24, two huge increases. The first one, which finished when people lost interest, but maybe synchronized, were, but in my opinion, there was no coordination in all this. Someone knew how to play the cards well at the right moment, but not in, in an organized way. So at this point, there was the second price surge when everybody was buying Bitcoin. This gave the start to a huge increase in value without an underlying basis. In reality, Bitcoin in this portion, in the first half, it was one of the rare occasions in its life in which it enjoyed underlying support. And what was the underlying support? The service of having the data back. This is not to be overlooked. This gave an important stimulus to the creation to what is the phenomenon of the ICO. The cryptocurrencies are all beautiful, interesting. How do you create support for it? You imagine it like gold, something physical. In reality, some expert may tell me that it's not true, but I think the underlying support is the occasion to take money and not give it back. It's like an invoice. You make a service, somebody gives you money, it's true they bought your service, but for some experts, you've taken the money and they can't ask for it back. You've compensated with the service, but you've taken the money. The support is that you get the money for a service and you don't have to give it back. But if this something is a service, a car, 
a washing machine, a piece of consulting, I give the money and I don't want it back, which is different to a loan or speculation. In fact, the delicate aspect of other currencies that don't have an underlying support, but are based on hope strategies to some extent. Some call them Ponzi schemes. But fundamentally, I can invent a money based on money or on the joy of living. And this is my underlying support. People buy it, but underneath there's nothing under it. I buy it because I can look at the historic data. I can see that it's growing. I hope that tomorrow it'll be worth more and I can resell it. To who? To who didn't have the foresight to buy the day before? Yesterday it cost two, today four. So where's the underlying support? Hey, yesterday I was here and you weren't. I was in the queue before you. If you'd like, I'll sell you my place in the queue. That's an underlying support. Strange, very different from the concept of gold or physical assets, but it's something that works at a worldwide level. It works because there's a lot of ignorance and incompetence. There are far more people I know that have lost real money in the world of crypto relative to those who have made money. This is my personal experience. This because market is a particular market, a market in which someone has a lever that if it makes the market rise, it will rise even further. Professional operators play, but this does not mean that it's a market destined to failure. For instance, there are some models of ICO that permit the supply of real services, and these are, for instance, the tokens. When you hear of RC20 and functional tokens, what does this mean? It means this. It means that, yes, we're in blockchain, but the blockchain is simply a model to guarantee that there is no fraud. Let's say we do the business of, of showers on the beach. We invent a machine that warms the water. At this point, we decide to put them in all the beach resorts of the world. So we go to the man who owns the resort and we say, Dear sir, would you like my solar shower? He says, no, I don't want it. It's too expensive, I've got one. So we have some difficulty selling this stuff. So we do a different reasoning. We think like a crypto entrepreneur. We go to the resort and we say, we'll give you the shower for nothing. And the beach resort installs the shower. How can I earn from this? How does this solar shell work? It works with tokens. It works only with tokens. This is important. Not only with tokens. Okay. Who can I buy these tokens from? There's somebody with a pocket full of tokens. Say to your clients, go to that person you buy the tokens, he makes the price. Then we, we go look for this person who didn't exist beforehand. We say, give me a thousand euros, a million euros. And what do you want me to do? We say, we'll give you two million tokens. You could decide the price of what the Shower, shower token cost. At first sight, with 50 cents, it should be okay. Here's a million euros. A part we use to, bake, to make these showers. And this person has two million tokens in his pocket. The summer arrives, people line up. 
this person has put up an exchange for his tokens with an algorithm. Because when the summer arrives and everybody wants to have a shower, it's not interesting that there are tokens everywhere. If the shower is only there, I admit three or four tokens each day and four people can have a shower. How much are you prepared to pay for one of those tokens if there are a thousand people in Seaside? So these algorithms regulate the price according to the affluence, the best possible performance of the sales of the tokens. And this in the digital world, we call DeFi the possibility to have capital, ICO, and emit tokens, which are functional tokens. What happens if these shards don't exist? So many have invested in ICO and lost everything because nobody had a shower. What's worse? is that if I do have a shower that works with euros or tokens, this is the worst thing because I've respected my obligations, but I didn't tell the guy with the tokens that people could also pay for it with euros. But you should have told me first. You shouldn't have let people pay with cash. Uh, but this way, I earn money with the euros. The tokens, you earn with them. Uh, many scammers, as they're called, have had important problems of managing crypto. They had a lot of capital in euros, and it was difficult to manage capital in crypto. So when they had created the project and done everything else, they preferred to take euros. Given all this, we have an exchange. Our exchange has made some important choices. The first of which is that the currencies are stable coin. There is no question of algorithms because we work with companies. And when we, you work with companies, these little games can go well or they can go badly. And in general, a company earns from risk, but it's a calculated risk. So today, if I'm a professional, I offer my advice at 2,000 euros a day. I know it's a risk. One day I work, but hopefully I find somebody who pays me and I earn more. I may have to lower the price, I could raise the price but I have the control because I've chosen to set the price. I can even arrive at 100,000 a day. Who knows? Maybe I don't work for 200 days. It's a choice, a calculated risk. How can you say I earn one Luca coin, but who sets the price? Well, who knows? You can't do anything in these circumstances, it's the market sets the price and they won't accept this. If I sell solar panels by this way and at some point the market falls and then they pay me two euros per panel and I have to sell them at that price. But I bought them with real money, not crypto hugs. So the companies have great difficulty in entering the crypto market they can do it as an investment. But selling in blockchain with lots of crypto for many of our clients is the furthest thing from what they want to do. So how do they earn? They earn from services, creating underlying support, creating the token, creating the functionality, but in fact, creating via the smart contract those properties of disintermediated exchange. Now we arrive at the most important part 
of the understanding of why we think you should do custom money. That is a currency that has a reason to exist. If at a certain moment there's a company that makes devices to, to project drawings of great value, okay. it It has engineered this thing. It's a television, a projector, which has a device which is attached to the network. And these designs of great value are worth hundreds of thousands of euros. So a Russian bloke who decides to buy it. It buys this whole lot. The physical cost, not very much. With respect to the 100,000 of the value of the drawing, it's negligible. It's the equivalent of the, the box that Amazon used to send you something. So the added value is not the physical object, but what's inside. So, the bloke buys this kind of thing. At a certain point, he decides to resell it. We're in the digital world. What does decide to sell mean? What does this mean? Sell a photo, sell the photo, which is of a limited number. There are only 10 of these photos in the world. You can't copy it. And even if you could, could copy it, it's like having a photograph of the Mona Lisa. You can't patent that. To be the owner, there has to be a register that you're the owner. Let's say this register is the blockchain. There's a compu computational space. This is the account, A, at a certain point. At the point of Luca, it's written that Luca has the Mona Lisa, one of 10 pieces. This becomes the only register available, not one of the possible registers. At this point, what happens? He decides to sell it to Andrea. When he decides to sell to Andrea, the user, this he does a simple operation. He goes on the smart contract, which manages all this object and says, go to the point of Luca and say the object can be sold. He recognizes Luca's signature. Only Luca can set that the work of art can be sold. So then Andrea turns up and says, I want that work of art. If there was no blockchain, he'd send a bank draft. And maybe with a sales transaction. Or maybe I take the, the draft. How can you be certain that I don't go off with the bank draft? You use a smart contract. That when Luca decides to sell the piece of work, I say that I want at least 200,000 euros. At a certain point, Luca does a draft of 200,000 euros, which in the blockchain is called transaction. The smart contract sees that I have satisfied the mathematical criteria, moves the ownership of the Mona Lisa from here to Andrea. Luca no longer has the ownership of the Mona Lisa. The ownership has gone to Andrea, and if Luca tries to sell it again, he can't do it. The instrument realizes this, and the instrument turns off the projection. It knows where the new device is. It's the new device that's connected to the wallet. So the event arrives. 
there's a new work of art. And these devices have a cryptographic key. The new work of art is encrypted with the public key of the user and it can be disencrypted with the private key of the user. And the private key is here. So, as he knows the public key, he takes the work of art, he encrypts it with a new public key, and this is where the story ends. He extracts the work of art. The private key is inside the TPM, which manages to interpret the work of art, and that's how the work appears on a new screen. How can you do this with a bank draft? How much can a project like this be worth? We've built this model on euros, but this stuff doesn't work on euros. It works on cryptocurrencies. So this bloke has made his own digital money, which allows him to do this operation. But at the beginning, there is none of this money around. So this is the problem that everybody starts off with when they come into this world. So we have thought about creating an important relationship with financial institutions in which we have the correct licenses for these operations so that we can give an IBAN code not to the company but to that little device. We give the IBAN code to an IoT device. This money arrives. This money go to that IBAN and the bank puts them into an escrow account, which cannot be touched by anybody except by looking at the blockchain and seeing what the blockchain says. So if in this moment the money is there, nobody says to touch it, the money stays there. It's the conditions of the blockchain satisfaction of the smart contract. The rules say that the transfer to another is permitted. The bank replies, it moves the ownership. The money stays in the same place. What changes is who has the right to take the money. We create the escrow for this purpose. It's not that money is moved from one place to another, but the final result is that I have made a draft I get the cryptocurrency returned to me, which is what serves to buy the object. I buy that object. The cryptocurrency ends up with the owner and the owner wants euros. So he goes back to the system. The euros are ready for him. And so he says, now they're mine. I have title to these euros, but I've sold the painting. So in my wallet, I've got this, so I now want the original money which started off the whole process. This is a service which is complex to engineer, but it's what represents the most important part of the business of this company. We realized that people needed new money to do these operations. The new money has no value. It can be left to the speculative world if they like it, but you can organize yourself as stable coin. But the stable coin needs to be covered. For the cover, we have obtained the willingness of banks to offer us the service of holding monies for third parties. So, given this, there is a whole policy of the legislator that allows this. There's a law linked to the circuits of limited spending within which the movement of money can be used for specific purposes. And seen from outside, from outside we should be seen as an exchange which permits, we like to define it as a casino operation. You come with euro, you get tokens back with the tokens you play in the blockchain, you buy, sell, disintermediate. When you're tired, you go back and you change back into euros. Clearly, this operation has a commission. 
of around one and a half percent. It's low.